Diggory Diggory Delphit, a little old man in black velvet. He digs and he delves, you can see for yourselves. The mounds dug by Diggory Delphit. The Tale of Timmy Tiptoes Once upon a time, there was a little fat, comfortable grey squirrel called Timmy Tiptoes. He had a nest thatched with leaves in the top of a tall tree, and he had a little squirrel wife called Goody. Timmy Tiptoes sat out, enjoying the breeze. He whisked his tail and chuckled, Little wife Goody, the nuts are ripe. We must lay up a store for winter and spring. Goody Tiptoes was busy pushing moss under the thatch. The nest is so snug, we shall be sound asleep all winter. Then we shall wake up all the thinner when there is nothing to eat in springtime, replied prudent Timothy. When Timmy and Goody Tiptoes came to the nut thicket, they found other squirrels were there already. Timmy took off his jacket and hung it on a twig. They worked away quietly by themselves. Every day they made several journeys and picked quantities of nuts. They carried them away in bags and stored them in several hollow stumps near the tree where they had built their nest. When these stumps were full, they began to empty the bags into a hole high up in a tree that had belonged to a woodpecker. The nuts rattled down, down, down inside. How, how shall we ever get them out again? It is like a money box, said Goody. I shall be much thinner before springtime, my love, said Timmy Tiptoes, peeping into the hole. They did collect quantities, because they did not lose them. Squirrels who bury their nuts in the ground lose more than half, because they cannot remember the place. The most forgetful squirrel in the wood was called Silvertail. He began to dig, and he could not remember. And then he dug again, and found some nuts that did not belong to him. And there was a fight, and other squirrels began to dig. The whole wood was in commotion. Unfortunately, just at this time, a flock of little birds flew by from bush to bush, searching for green caterpillars and spiders. There were several sorts of little birds twittering different songs. The first one sang, Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? And another sang, Little bit of bread and no cheese, little bit of bread and no cheese. The squirrels followed and listened. The first little bird flew into the bush where Timmy and Goody Tiptoes were quietly tying up their bags. And it sang, Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? Timmy Tiptoes went on with his work without replying. Indeed, the little bird did not expect an answer. It was only singing its natural song and it meant nothing at all. But when the other squirrels heard that song, they rushed upon Timmy Tiptoes and cuffed and scratched him and upset his bag of nuts. The innocent little bird, which had caused all the mischief, flew away in a fright. Timmy rolled over and over and then turned tail and fled toward his nest, followed by a crowd of squirrels shouting, Who's been the nuts? They caught him and dragged him up the very same tree where there was the little round hole, and they pushed him in. The hole was much too small for Timmy Tiptoe's figure. They squeezed him dreadfully. It was a wonder they did not break his ribs. We will leave him here till he confesses, said Silvertail Squirrel, and he shouted into the hole, Who's been digging up my nuts? Timmy Tiptoes made no reply. He had tumbled down inside the tree upon half a peck of nuts belonging to himself. He lay quite stunned and still. Goody Tiptoes picked up the nut bags and went home. She made a cup of tea for Timmy, but he didn't come and didn't come. Goody Tiptoes passed a lonely and unhappy night. Next morning, she ventured back to the nut bushes to look for him, but the other unkind squirrels drove her away. She wandered all over the wood calling, Timmy Tiptoes, Timmy Tiptoes, oh, where is Timmy Tiptoes? In the meantime, Timmy Tiptoes came to his senses. He found himself tucked up in a little moss bed, very much in the dark, feeling sore. It seemed to be underground. Timmy coughed <laughs> and groaned because his ribs hurt him. There was a chirpy noise, and a small striped chipmunk appeared with a nightlight and hoped he felt better. 
It was most kind to Timmy Tiptoes. It lent him its nightcap, and the house was full of provisions. The chipmunk explained that it had rained nuts through the top of the tree. Besides, I found a few buried. It laughed and chuckled when it heard Timmy's story. While Timmy was confined to bed, it enticed him to eat more. But how shall I ever get out through that hole unless I thin myself? My wife will be anxious. Just another nut or two nuts. Let me crack them for you, said the chipmunk. Timmy Tiptoes grew fatter and fatter. Now Goody Tiptoes had set to work again by herself. She did not put any more nuts into the woodpecker's hole because she had always doubted how they could be got out again. She hid them under a tree root. They rattled down, down, down. Once, when Goody emptied an extra big bag full, there was a decided squeak. And next time Goody brought another bag full, a little striped chipmunk scrambled out in a hurry. It is getting perfectly full up downstairs. The sitting room is full, and they are rolling along the passage. And my husband, Chippy Hacky, has run away and left me. What is the explanation of these showers of nuts? I am sure I beg your pardon. I did not know that anybody lived here, said Mrs. Goody Tiptoes. But where is Chippy Hacky? My husband, Timmy Tiptoes, has run away too. I know where Chippy is. A little bird told me, said Mrs. Chippy Hacky. She led the way to the woodpecker's tree, and they listened at the hole. Down below, there was a noise of nutcrackers, and a fat squirrel voice, and a thin squirrel voice was singing, My little old man and I fell out. How shall we bring this matter about? Bring it about as well as you can, and get you gone, you little old man. You could squeeze in through that little round hole, said Goody Tiptoes. Yes, I could, said the chipmunk, but my husband, Chippy Hacky, bites. Down below there was a noise of cracking nuts and nibbling, and then the fat squirrel voice and the thin squirrel voice saying, For diddle dum day, day diddle dum da day, diddle diddle dum dum day. Then Goody peeped in at the hole and called down, Timmy Tiptoes, oh fie, Timmy Tiptoes. And Timmy replied, Is that you, Goody Tiptoes? Why, certainly. He came up and kissed Goody through the hole, but he was so fat that he could not get out. Chippy Hacky was not too fat, but he did not want to come. He stayed down below and chuckled. And so it went on for a fortnight, till a big wind blew off the top of the tree and opened up the hole and let in the rain. Then Timmy Tiptoes came out and went home with an umbrella. But Chippy Hacky continued to camp out for another week, although it was uncomfortable. At last, a large bear came walking through the wood. Perhaps he also was looking for nuts. He seemed to be sniffing around. Chippy Hacky went home in a hurry. And when Chippy Hacky got home, he found he had caught a cold in his head and he was more uncomfortable still. And now Timmy and Goody Tiptoes keep their nut store fastened up with a little padlock. And whenever that little bird sees the chipmunks, he sings, Who's been digging up my nuts? Who's been digging up my nuts? But nobody ever answers. The end. Now who is this knocking at Cottontail's door? Tap, tap it. Tap, tap it. She's heard it before. And when she peeps out, there is nobody there but a present of carrots put down on the stair. Hark! I hear it again. Tap, tap, tap it. Tap, tap it. Why, I really believe it's a little black rabbit. The story of Miss Moppet. This is a pussy called Miss Moppet. She thinks she has heard a mouse. This is the mouse peeping out behind the cupboard and making fun of Miss Moppet. He is not afraid of a kitten. This is Miss Moppet jumping just too late. She misses the mouse and hits her own head. She thinks it is a very hard cupboard. The mouse watches Miss Moppet from the top of the cupboard. Miss Moppet ties up her head in a duster and sits before the fire. The mouse thinks she's looking very ill. 
he comes sliding down the bell pole. Miss Moppet looks worse and worse. The mouse comes a little nearer. Miss Moppet holds her poor head in her paws and looks at him through a hole in the duster. The mouse comes very close. And then, all of a sudden, Miss Moppet jumps upon the mouse. And because the mouse has teased Miss Moppet, Miss Moppet thinks she will tease the mouse, which is not at all nice of Miss Moppet. She ties him up in the duster and tosses it about like a ball. But she forgot about that hole in the duster. And when she untied it, there was no mouse. He has wriggled out and run away. And he's dancing a jig on top of the cupboard. The end. We have a little garden, a garden of our own. And every day we water there the seeds that we have sown. We love our little garden and tend it with such care you will not find a faded leaf or blighted blossom there. The Tale of Samuel Whiskers or The Roly Poly Pudding Once upon a time there was an old cat called Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit who was an anxious parent. She used to lose her kittens continually, and whenever they were lost, they were always in mischief. On baking day, she determined to shut them up in a cupboard. She caught Moppet in mittens, but she could not find Tom. Mrs. Tabitha went up and down all over the house, mewing for Tom Kitten. She looked in the pantry under the staircase and she searched the best spare bedroom that was all covered up with dust sheets. She went right upstairs and looked into the attics, but she could not find him anywhere. It was an old, old house, full of cupboards and passages. Some of the walls were four feet thick and there used to be queer noises inside them, as if there might be a little secret staircase. Certainly there were odd little jagged doorways in the wainscot, and things disappeared at night, especially cheese and bacon. Mrs. Tabitha became more and more distracted and mew dreadfully. While their mother was searching the house, Moppet and Mittens had got into mischief. The cupboard door was not locked, so they pushed it open and came out. They went straight to the dough which was set to rise in a pan before the fire. They patted it with their little soft paws. Shall we make dear little muffins? said Mittens to Moppet. But just at that moment, somebody knocked at the front door and Moppet jumped into the flour barrel in a fright. Mittens ran away to the dairy and hid in an empty jar on the stone shelf where the milk pans stand. The visitor was a neighbor, Mrs. Ribby. She had called to borrow some yeast. Mrs. Tabitha came downstairs mewing dreadfully. Come in, Cousin Ribby, come in and sit you down. I'm in sad trouble, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha, shedding tears. I've lost my dear son, Thomas. I'm afraid the rats have got him. She wiped her eyes with her apron. He's a bad kitten, Cousin Tabitha. He's made a cat's cradle of my best bonnet last time I came to tea. Where have you looked for him? All over the house. The rats are too many for me. What a thing it is to have an unruly family, said Mrs. Tabitha Twitchit. I'm not afraid of rats. I will help you to find him and whip him too. What is all that soot in the fender? The chimney wants sweeping. Oh dear me, Cousin Ribby. Now Moppet and Mittens are gone. They have both got out of the cupboard. Ribby and Tabitha set to work to search the house thoroughly again. They poked under the beds with Ribby's umbrella and they rummaged in cupboards. They even fetched a candle and looked inside a clothes chest in one of the attics. They could not find anything. But once they heard a door bang and somebody scuttered downstairs. 
Yes, it is infested with rats, said Tabitha tearfully. I caught seven young ones out of one hole in the back kitchen, and we had them for dinner last Saturday. Then once I saw the old father rat, an enormous old rat, Cousin Ribby. I was just going to jump upon him when he showed his yellow teeth at me and whisked down the hole. The rats get on my nerves, Cousin Ribby, said Tabitha. Ribby and Tabitha searched and searched. They both heard a curious roly-poly noise under the attic floor, but there was nothing to be seen. They returned to the kitchen. Here's one of your kittens at least, said Ribby, dragging Moppet out of the flour barrel. They shook the flour off her and set her down on the kitchen floor. She seemed to be in a terrible fright. Oh, mother, mother, said Moppet. There's been an old woman rat in the kitchen and she's stolen some of the dough. The two cats ran to look at the dough pan. Sure enough, there were marks of little scratching fingers and a lump of dough was gone. Which way did she go, Moppet? But Moppet had been too much frightened to peep out of the barrel again. Ribby and Tabitha took her with them to keep her safely in sight while they went on with their search. They went into the dairy. The first thing they found was Mittens hiding in an empty jar. They tipped over the jar and she scrambled out. Oh, mother, mother, said Mittens. There has been an old man rat in the dairy. A dreadful, enormous big rat, mother, and he's stolen a pat of butter and the rolling pin. Ribby and Tabitha looked at one another. A rolling pin and butter. Oh, my poor son, Thomas, exclaimed Tabitha, wringing her paws. A rolling pin, said Ribby. Did we not hear a roly-poly noise in the attic when we were looking into that chest? Ribby and Tabitha rushed upstairs again. Sure enough, the roly-poly noise was still going on quite distinctly under the attic floor. This is serious, Cousin Tabitha, said Ribby. We must send for John Joyner at once with a saw. Now, this is what had been happening to Tom Kitten, and it shows how very unwise it is to go up a chimney in a very old house where a person does not know his way and where there are enormous rats. Tom Kitten did not want to be shut up in a cupboard. When he saw that his mother was going to bake, he determined to hide. He looked about for a nice, convenient place, and he fixed upon the chimney. The fire had only just been lighted, and it was not hot, but there was a white, choky smoke from the green sticks. Tom Kitten got upon the fender and looked up. It was a big, old-fashioned fireplace. The chimney itself was wide enough inside for a man to stand up and walk about so there was plenty of room for a little Tom Cat. He jumped right up into the fireplace, balancing himself upon the iron bar where the kettle hangs. Tom Kitten took another big jump off the bar and landed on a ledge high up inside the chimney, mucking down some soot into the fender. Tom Kitten coughed <laughs> and choked with the smoke. He could hear the sticks beginning to crackle and burn in the fireplace down below. He made up his mind to climb right to the top and get out on the slates and try to catch sparrows. I cannot go back. If I slipped, I might fall in the fire and singe my beautiful tail and my little blue jacket. The chimney was a very big, old-fashioned one. It was built in the days when people burnt logs of wood upon the hearth. The chimney stack stood up above the roof like a little stone tower, and the daylight shone down from the top under the slanting slates that kept out the rain. Tom Kitten was getting very frightened. He climbed up and up and up. Then he waded sideways through inches of soot. He was like a little sweep himself. It was most confusing in the dark. One flue seemed to lead into another. There was less smoke, but Tom Kitten felt quite lost. He scrambled up and up, but before he reached the chimney top, he came to a place where somebody had loosened a stone in the wall. There were some mutton bones lying about. 
This seems funny, said Tom Kitten. Who has been gnawing bones up here in the chimney? I wish I'd never come. And what a funny smell. It is something like a mouse, only dreadfully strong. It makes me sneeze, said Tom Kitten. He squeezed through the hole in the wall and dragged himself along a most uncomfortably tight passage where there was scarcely any light. He groped his way carefully for several yards. He was at the back of the skirting board in the attic. All at once, he fell head over heels in the dark, down a hole, and landed on a heap of very dirty rags. When Tom Kitten picked himself up and looked around him, he found himself in a place that he had never seen before, although he had lived all his life in the house. It was a very small, stuffy, fusty room with boards and rafters and cobwebs and lath and plaster. Opposite to him, as far away as he could sit, was an enormous rat. What do you mean by tumbling into my bed all covered with smuts? said the rat, chattering his teeth. Please, sir, the chimney wants sweeping, said poor Tom Kitten. Anna Maria! Anna Maria! squeaked the rat. There was a pattering noise, and an old woman rat poked her head round a rafter. All in a minute, she rushed upon Tom Kitten, and before he knew what was happening, his coat was pulled off, and he was rolled up in a bundle and tied with string in very hard knots. Anna Maria did the tying. The old rat watched her. When she had finished, they both sat staring at him with their mouths open. Anna Maria, said the old man rat, whose name was Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria, make me a kitten dumpling, roly-poly pudding for my dinner. It requires dough and a pat of butter and a rolling pin, said Anna Maria, considering Tom Kitten with her head on one side. No, said Samuel Whiskers. Make it properly, Anna Maria, with breadcrumbs. Nonsense! Butter and dough, replied Anna Maria. The two rats consulted together for a few minutes and then went away. Samuel Whiskers got through a hole in the wainscot and went boldly down the front staircase to the dairy to get the butter. He did not meet anybody. He made a second journey for the rolling pin. He pushed it in front of him with his paws like a brewer's man trundling a barrel. He could hear Ribby and Tabitha talking, but they were too busy lighting the candle to look into the chest. They did not see him. Anna Maria went down by way of skirting board and a window shutter to the kitchen to steal the dough. She borrowed a small saucer and scooped up the dough with her paws. She did not notice Moppet. While Tom Kitten was left alone under the floor of the attic, he wriggled about and tried to mew for help. But his mouth was full of soot and cobwebs, and he was tied up in such very tight knots, he could not make anybody hear him, except a spider who came out of a crack in the ceiling and examined the knots critically from a safe distance. It was a judge of knots, because it had a habit of tying up unfortunate blue bottles. It did not offer to assist him. Tom Kitten wriggled and squirmed until he was quite exhausted. Presently, the rats came back and set to work to make him into a dumpling. First they smeared him with butter, and then they rolled him in the dough. Will not the string be very indigestible, Anna Maria? inquired Samuel Whiskers. Anna Maria said she thought that it was of no consequence, but she wished that Tom Kitten would hold his head still as it disarranged the pastry. She laid hold of his ears. Tom Kitten bit and spit and mewed and wriggled, and the rolling pin went roly-poly, roly, roly-poly, roly, roly. The rats each held an end. His tail is sticking out. You did not fetch enough dough, Anna Maria. I fetched as much as I could carry, replied Anna Maria. I do not think, said Samuel Whiskers, pausing to take a look at Tom Kitten. I do not think it will be a good pudding. It smells sooty. 
Anna Maria was about to argue the point when all at once there began to be other sounds up above. The rasping noise of a saw and the noise of a little dog scratching and yelping. The rats dropped the rolling pin and listened attentively. We are discovered and interrupted, Anna Maria. Let us collect our property and other people's and depart at once. I fear that we shall be obliged to leave this pudding. But I am persuaded that the nuts would have proved indigestible, whatever you may urge to the contrary. Come away at once and help me to tie up some mutton bones in a bedspread, said Anna Maria. I've got half a smoked ham hidden in the chimney. So it happened that by the time John Joyner had got the plank up, there was nobody here under the floor except the rolling pin and Tom Kitten in a very dirty dumpling. But there was a strong smell of rats, and John Joyner spent the rest of the morning sniffing and whining and wagging his tail and going round and round with his head in the hole like a gimlet. He nailed the plank down again and put his tools in his bag and came downstairs. The cat family had quite recovered. They invited him to stay to dinner. The dumpling had been peeled off Tom Kitten and made separately into a bag pudding with currants in it to hide the smuts. They had been obliged to put Tom Kitten into a hot bath to get the butter off. John Joyner smelt the pudding, but he regretted that he had not time to stay for dinner because he had just finished making a wheelbarrow from his potter and she had ordered two hen coops. Later in the afternoon, Mr. Samuel Whiskers and his wife were seen running down the lane with big bundles on a little wheelbarrow. Samuel Whiskers was puffing and out of breath. Anna Maria was still arguing in shrill tones. She seemed to know her way, and she seemed to have a lot of luggage. They went into the barn and hauled their parcels with a bit of string to the top of the haystack. After that, there were no more rats for a long time at Tabitha Twitchett's. The End Apply Dapply, a little brown mouse, goes to the cupboard in somebody's house. In somebody's cupboard, there's everything nice. Cake, cheese, jam, biscuits, all charming for mice. Apply Dapply has little sharp eyes, and Apply Dapply is so fond of pies. Diggory Diggory Delvet, a little old man in black velvet. He digs and he delves, you can see for yourselves. The mounds dug by Diggory Delvet. Now who is this knocking at Cottontail's door? Tap tap it, tap tap it, she's heard it before. And when she peeps out, there is nobody there. But a present of carrots put down on the stair. Hark, I hear it again. Tap 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 it, tap tap it. Why, I really believe it's a little black rabbit. We have a little garden, a garden of our own, and every day we water there the seeds that we have sown. We love our little garden, and tend it with such care you will not find a faded leaf or blighted blossom there. Apply Dapply, a little brown mouse, goes to the cupboard in somebody's house. In somebody's cupboard, there's everything nice. Cake, cheese, jam, biscuits, all charming for mice. Apply Dapply has little sharp eyes, and Apply Dapply is so fond of pies. The Tale of Johnny Town Mouse Johnny Town Mouse was born in a cupboard. Timmy Willy was born in a garden. Timmy Willy was a little country mouse who went to town by mistake in a hamper. The gardener sent vegetables to town once a week by carrier. He packed them in a big hamper. The gardener left the hamper by the garden gate so that the carrier could pick it up when he passed. 
Timmy Willie crept in through a hole in the wickerwork, and after eating some peas, Timmy Willie fell fast asleep. He awoke in a fright while the hamper was being lifted into the carrier's cart. And then there was a jolting and a clattering of horses' feet. Other packages were thrown in. For miles and miles, jolt, 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 and Timmy Willie trembled amongst the jumbled up vegetables. At last, the cart stopped at a house where the hamper was taken out, carried in, and set down. The cook gave the carrier sixpence, the back door banged, and the cart rumbled away. But there was no quiet. There seemed to be hundreds of carts passing. Dogs barked, boys whistled in the street, the cook laughed, the parlor maid ran up and down stairs, and the canary sang like a steam engine. Timmy Willie, who had lived all his life in a garden, was almost frightened to death. Presently, the cook opened the hamper and began to unpack the vegetables. Out sprang the terrified Timmy Willie. Up jumped the cook on a chair, exclaiming, oh, A mouse! A mouse! Call the cat! Fetch me the poker, Sarah! Timmy Willie did not wait for Sarah with the poker. He rushed along the skirting board till he came to a little hole and in he popped. He dropped half a foot and crashed into the middle of a mouse dinner party, breaking three glasses. Who in the world is this? inquired Johnny Town Mouse. But after the first exclamation of surprise, he instantly recovered his manners. With the utmost politeness, he introduced Timmy Willie to nine other mice, all with long tails and white neckties. Timmy Willie's own tail was insignificant. Johnny Town Mouse and his friends noticed it, but they were too well bred to make personal remarks. Only one of them asked Timmy Willie if he'd ever been in a trap. The dinner was of eight courses. Not much of anything, but truly elegant. All the dishes were unknown to Timmy Willie, who would have been a little afraid of tasting them. Only he was very hungry and very anxious to behave with company manners. The continual noise upstairs made him so nervous that he dropped a plate. Never mind, they don't belong to us, said Johnny. Why don't those youngsters come back with a dessert? It should be explained that two young mice who were waiting on the others went skirmishing upstairs to the kitchen between courses. Several times they had come tumbling in, squeaking and laughing. Timmy Willie learnt with horror that they were being chased by the cat. His appetite failed. He felt faint. Try some jelly, said Johnny Town Mouse. No? Would you rather go to bed? I will show you a most comfortable sofa pillow. The sofa pillow had a hole in it. Johnny Town Mouse quite honestly recommended it as the best bed, kept exclusively for visitors. But the sofa smelt of cat. Timmy Willie preferred to spend a miserable night under the fender. It was just the same the next day. An excellent breakfast was provided for mice accustomed to eat bacon. But Timmy Willie had been reared on roots and salad. Johnny Town Mouse and his friends racketed about under the floors and came boldly out all over the house in the evening. One particularly loud crash had been caused by Sarah tumbling downstairs with the tea tray. There were crumbs and sugar and smears of jam to be collected in spite of the cat. Timmy Willie longed to be at home in his peaceful nest in a sunny bank. The food disagreed with him. The noise prevented him from sleeping. In a few days, he grew so thin that Johnny Town Mouse noticed it and questioned him. He listened to Timmy Willie's story and inquired about the garden. It sounds rather a dull place. What do you do when it rains? When it rains, I sit in my little sandy burrow and shell corn and seeds from my autumn store. I peep out at the throstles and blackbirds on the lawn and my friend Cock Robin. And when the sun comes out again, you should see my garden and the flowers, roses and pinks and pansies. No noise except the birds and bees and the lambs in the meadows. There goes that cat again, exclaimed Johnny Town Mouse. When they had taken refuge in the coal cellar, he resumed the conversation. 
I confess I am a little disappointed. We have endeavoured to entertain you, Timothy William. Oh, yes, yes, you have been most kind, but I do feel so ill, said Timmy Willie. It may be that your teeth and digestion are unaccustomed to our food. Perhaps it might be wiser for you to return in the hamper. Oh, oh, cried Timmy Willie. Why, of course, for the matter of that, we could have sent you back last week, said Johnny rather huffily. Did you not know that the hamper goes back empty on Saturdays? So Timmy Willie said goodbye to his new friends and hid in the hamper with a crumb of cake and a withered cabbage leaf. And after much jolting, he was set down safely in his own garden. Oh. Sometimes on Saturdays, he went to look at the hamper lying by the gate, but he knew better than to get in again. And nobody got out, though Johnny Town Mouse had half promised to visit. The winter passed. The sun came out again. Timmy Willie sat by his burrow, warming his little fur coat and sniffing the smell of violets and spring grass. He had nearly forgotten his visit to town when up the sandy path, all spick and span with a brown leather bag, came Johnny Town Mouse. Timmy Willie received him with open arms. You have come at the best of all the year. We will have herb pudding and sit in the sun. Hmm, it is a little damp, said Johnny Town Mouse, who was carrying his tail under his arm out of the mud. What is that fearful noise? He started violently. That, said Timmy Willie, that is only a cow. I will beg a little milk. They are quite harmless, unless they happen to lie down upon you. How are all our friends? Johnny's account was rather middling. He explained why he was paying his visit so early in the season. The family had gone to the seaside for Easter. The cook was doing spring cleaning on board wages, with particular instructions to clear out the mice. There were four kittens, and the cat had killed the canary. They say we did it, but I know better, said Johnny Townhouse. Whatever is that fearful racket? That is only the lawnmower. I will fetch some grass clippings presently to make your bed. I am sure you had better settle in the country, Johnny. Hmm. We shall see by Tuesday week. The hamper is stopped while they are at the seaside. I am sure you will never want to live in town again, said Timmy Willie. But he did. He went back in the very next hamper of vegetables. He said it was too quiet. One place suits one person, another place suits another person. For my part, I prefer to live in the country, like Timmy Willie. The end. Ninny Nanny Nettycoat in a white petticoat with a red nose. The longer she stands, the shorter she grows. The Tale of Mrs. Tittlemouse Once upon a time, there was a wood mouse, and her name was Mrs. Tittlemouse. She lived in a bank under a hedge. Such a funny house. There were yards and yards of sandy passages leading to storerooms and nut cellars and seed cellars all amongst the roots of the hedge. There was a kitchen, a parlor, a pantry, and a larder. Also, there was Mrs. Tittlemouse's bedroom where she slept in a little box bed. Mrs. Tittlemouse was a most terribly tidy particular little mouse always sweeping and dusting the soft, sandy floors. Sometimes a beetle lost its way in the passages. Little dirty feet, said Mrs. Tittlemouse, clattering her dustpan. And one day, a little old woman ran up and down in a red spotty cloak. Your house is on fire, Mother Ladybird. Fly away home to your children. Another day, a big fat spider came into shelter from the rain. Beg pardon, is this not Miss Muffet's? 
Go away, you bold, bad spider, leaving ends of cobweb all over my nice, clean house. She bundled the spider out at a window. He let himself down the hedge with a long, thin bit of string. Mrs. Tittlemouse went on her way to a distant storeroom to fetch cherry stones and thistledown seed for dinner. All along the passage, she sniffed and looked at the floor. I smell a smell of honey. Is it the cowslips outside in the hedge? I'm sure I can see the marks of little dirty feet. Suddenly, round a corner, she met Babbity Bumble. <coughs> said the bumblebee. Mrs. Tittlemouse looked at her severely. She wished that she had a broom. Good day, Babbity Bumble. I should be glad to buy some beeswax. But what are you doing down here? Why do you always come in at a window and say zzz, bzz, bzz? Mrs. Tittlemouse began to get cross. Zzz, whizz, whizz, replied Babbity Bumble in a peevish squeak. She sidled down a passage and disappeared into a storeroom, which had been used for acorns. Mrs. Tittlemouse had eaten the acorns before Christmas. The storeroom ought to have been empty, but it was full of untidy, dry moss. Mrs. Tittlemouse began to pull out the moss. Three or four other bees put their heads out and buzzed fiercely. I am not in the habit of renting rooms. This is an intrusion, said Mrs. Tittlemouse. I will have them turned out. I wonder who would help me. I will not have Mr. Jackson. He never wipes his feet. Mrs. Tittlemouse decided to leave the bees till after dinner. When she got back to the parlor, she heard someone coughing in a fat voice. And there sat Mr. Jackson himself. He was sitting all over a small rocking chair, twiddling his thumbs and smiling with his feet on the fender. He lived in a drain below the hedge, in a very dirty, wet ditch. How do you do, Mr. Jackson? Deary me, you have got very wet. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. I'll sit a while and dry myself, said Mr. Jackson. He sat and smiled, and the water dripped off his coattails. Mrs. Tittlemouse went round with a mop. He sat such a while that he had to be asked if he would take some dinner. First she offered him cherry stones. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. No teeth, no teeth, no teeth said Mr. Jackson. He opened his mouth most unnecessarily wide. He certainly had not a tooth in his head. Then she offered him thistledown seed. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, poof, 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 said Mr. Jackson, blowing thistledown all over the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mrs. Tittlemouse. Now what I really, really should like would be a little dish of honey. I am afraid I have not got any, Mr. Jackson, said Mrs. Tittlemouse. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse, said the smiling Mr. Jackson. I can smell it. That is why I came to call. Mr. Jackson rose ponderously from the table and began to look into the cupboards. Mrs. Tittlemouse followed him with a dishcloth to wipe his large, wet footmarks off the parlor floor. When he had convinced himself that there was no honey in the cupboards, he began to walk down the passage. Indeed, indeed, you will get stuck fast, Mr. Jackson. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse. First, he squeezed into the pantry. Tiddly, widdly, widdly. No honey? No honey, Mrs. Tittlemouse? There were three creepy crawly people hiding in the plate rack. Two of them got away, but the littlest one he caught. Then he squeezed into the larder. Miss Butterfly was tasting the sugar, but she flew away out of the window. Tiddly, widdly, widdly, Mrs. Tittlemouse. You seem to have plenty of visitors. And without any invitation, said Mrs. Thomasina Tittlemouse. They went along the sandy passage. Tiddly, widdly, He met Babbity round a corner and snapped her up. 
and put her down again. I do not like bumblebees. They're all over bristles, said Mr. Jackson, wiping his mouth with his coat sleeve. Get out, you nasty old toad, shrieked Babbity Bumble. This is all too much, scolded Mrs. Tittlemouse. She shut herself up in the nut cellar while Mr. Jackson pulled out the bees' nest. He seemed to have no objection to stings. When Mrs. Tittlemouse ventured to come out, everybody had gone away. But the untidiness was something dreadful. Never did I see such a mess. Smears of honey and moss and thistledown and marks of big and little dirty feet all over my nice clean house. She gathered up the moss and the remains of the beeswax. Then she went out and fetched some twigs to partly close up the front door. I will make it too small for Mr. Jackson. She fetched soft soap and flannel and a new scrubbing brush from the storeroom. But she was too tired to do any more. First she fell asleep in her chair and then she went to bed. Will it ever be oh, tidy again, said poor Mrs. Tittlemouse. Next morning she got up very early and began a spring cleaning which lasted a fortnight. She swept and scrubbed and dusted and she rubbed up the furniture with beeswax and polished her little tin spoons. When it was all beautifully neat and clean, she gave a party to five other little mice without Mr. Jackson. He smelt the party and came up the bank, but he could not squeeze in at the door. So they handed him out acorn cupfuls of honeydew through the window, and he was not at all offended. He sat outside in the sun and said, Tiddly, widdly, widdly, your very good health, Mrs. Tittlemouse. <laughs> the end. There once was an amiable guinea pig who brushed back his hair like a periwig. He wore a sweet tie, as blue as the sky, and his whiskers and buttons were very big. The Pie and the Patty Pan Once upon a time, there was a pussycat called Ribby, who invited a little dog called Duchess to tea. Come in good time, my dear Duchess, said Ribby's letter, and we will have something so very nice. I am baking it in a pie dish, a pie dish with a pink rim. You never tasted anything so good, and you shall eat it all. I will eat muffins, my dear Duchess, wrote Ribby. I will come very punctually, my dear Ribby, wrote Duchess. And then at the end she added, I hope it isn't mouse. And then she thought, that did not look quite polite. So she scratched out, isn't mouse, and changed it to, I hope it will be fine. And she gave her letter to the postman. But she thought a great deal about Ribby's pie, and she read Ribby's letter over and over again. I am dreadfully afraid it will be mouse, said Duchess to herself. I really couldn't, couldn't eat mouse pie. And I shall have to eat it, because it is a party. And my pie was going to be veal and ham. A pink and white pie dish. And so is mine, just like Ribby's dishes. They were both bought at Tabitha Twitchett's. Duchess went into her larder and took the pie off a shelf and looked at it. Oh, what a good idea. Why shouldn't I rush along and put my pie into Ribby's oven when Ribby isn't there? Ribby, in the meantime, had received Duchess's answer, and as soon as she was sure that the little dog would come, she popped her pie into the oven. There were two ovens, one above the other. Some of the other knobs and handles were only ornamental and not intended to open. Ribby put the pie into the lower oven. The door was very stiff. The top oven bakes too quickly, said Ribby to herself. Ribby put on some coal and swept up the hearth. Then she went out with a can to the well for water to fill up the kettle. Then she began to set the room in order, for it was the sitting room as well as the kitchen. When Ribby had laid the table, she went out down the field to the farm to fetch milk and butter. When she came back, 
she peeped into the bottom oven. The pie looked very comfortable. Ribby put on her shawl and bonnet and went out again with a basket to the village shop to buy a packet of tea, a pound of lump sugar, and a pot of marmalade. And just at the same time, Duchess came out of her house at the other end of the village. Ribby met Duchess halfway down the street, also carrying a basket covered with a cloth. They only bowed to one another. They did not speak because they were going to have a party. And as soon as Duchess had got round the corner out of sight, she simply ran straight away to Ribby's house. Ribby went into the shop and bought what she required and came out after a pleasant gossip with cousin Tabitha Twitchit. Ribby went on to Timothy Baker's and bought the muffins. Then she went home. There seemed to be a sort of scuffling noise in the back passage as she was coming in at the front door, but there was nobody there. Duchess, in the meantime, had slipped out at the back door. It is a very odd thing that Ribby's pie was not in the oven when I put mine in, and I can't find it anywhere. I have looked all over the house. I put my pie into a nice hot oven at the top. I could not turn any of the other handles. I think that they are all ornamental, said Duchess, but I wish I could have removed the pie made of mouse. I cannot think what she has done with it. I heard Ribby coming, and I had to run out by the back door. Duchess went home and brushed her beautiful black coat, and then she picked a bunch of flowers in her garden as a present for Ribby, and passed the time until the clock struck four. Ribby, having assured herself by careful search that there was really no one hiding in the cupboard or in the larder, went upstairs to change her dress. She came downstairs again and made the tea and put the teapot on the hob. She peeped again into the bottom oven. The pie had become a lovely brown and it was steaming hot. She sat down before the fire to wait for the little dog. I am glad I used the bottom oven, said Ribby. The top one would certainly have been very much too hot. Very punctually, at four o'clock, Duchess started to go to the party. At a quarter past four to the minute, there came a most genteel little tep tepity. Is Mrs. Ribston at home? inquired Duchess in the porch. Come in, and how do you do, my dear Duchess, cried Ribby. I hope I see you well. Quite well, I thank you. And how do you do, my dear Ribby? said Duchess. I've brought you some flowers. What a delicious smell of pie. Oh, what lovely flowers. Yes, it is. Mouse and bacon. I think it wants another five minutes, said Ribby. Just a shade longer. I will pour out the tea while we wait. Do you take sugar, my dear Duchess? Oh, yes, please, my dear Ribby. And may I have a lump upon my nose? With pleasure, my dear Duchess. Duchess sat up with the sugar on her nose and sniffed. How good that pie smells. I do love veal and ham. I mean to say, mouse and bacon. She dropped the sugar in confusion and had to go hunting under the tea table, so she did not see which oven Ribby opened in order to get out the pie. Ribby set the pie upon the table. There was a very savory smell. Duchess came out from under the tablecloth munching sugar and sat up on a chair. I will cut the pie for you. I am going to have muffin and marmalade, said Ribby. I think, thought Duchess to herself, I think it would be wiser if I helped myself to pie, though Ribby did not seem to notice anything when she was cutting it. What very small, fine pieces it is cooked into. I did not remember that I had minced it up so fine. I suppose this is a quicker oven than my own. The pie dish was emptying rapidly. Duchess had had four helps already and was fumbling with the spoon. A little more bacon, my dear Duchess, said Ribby. Thank you, my dear Ribby. I was only feeling for the patty pan. The patty pan, my dear Duchess? The patty pan that holds up the pie crust, said Duchess, blushing under her black coat. Oh, I didn't put one in, my dear Duchess, 
said Ribby. I don't think it is necessary in pies made of mouse. Duchess fumbled with the spoon. I can't find it, she said anxiously. There isn't a patty pan, said Ribby, looking perplexed. Yes, indeed, my dear Ribby, where can it have gone to, said Duchess. Duchess looked very much alarmed and continued to scoop the inside of the pie dish. I have only four patty pans, and they are all in the cupboard. Duchess set up a howl. I shall die! I shall die! I have swallowed a patty pan! Oh, my dear Ribby, I do feel so ill! It is impossible, my dear Duchess. There was not a patty pan. Yes, there was, my dear Ribby. I am sure I have swallowed it. Well, let me prop you up with a pillow, my dear Duchess. Where do you think you'll feel it? Oh, I do feel so ill all over me, my dear Ribby. Shall I run for the doctor? Oh, yes, yes. Fetch Dr. Maggotty, my dear Ribby. He is a pie himself. He will certainly understand. Ribby settled Duchess in a chair before the fire and went out and hurried to the village to look for the doctor. She found him at the smithy. Ribby explained that her guest had swallowed a patty pan. Dr. Maggotty hopped so fast that Ribby had to run. It was most conspicuous. All the village could see that Ribby was fetching the doctor. But while Ribby had been hunting for the doctor, a curious thing had happened to Duchess, who had been left by herself sitting before the fire, sighing and groaning and feeling very unhappy. How could I have swallowed it? Such a large thing as a patty pen. She sat down again and stared mournfully at the grate. The fire crackled and danced. And something sizzled. Duchess started. She opened the door of the top oven. Out came a rich, steamy flavor of veal and ham, and there stood a fine, brown pie. And through a hole in the top of the pie crust, there was a glimpse of a little tin patty pan. Duchess drew a long breath. Then I must have been eating mouse. No wonder I feel ill. But perhaps I should feel worse if I had really swallowed a patty pan. What a very awkward thing to have to explain to Ribby. I think I will put my pie in the backyard and say nothing about it. When I go home, I will run round and take it away. She put it outside the back door and sat down again by the fire and shut her eyes. When Ribby arrived with the doctor, she seemed fast asleep. Oh, I am feeling very much better, said Duchess, waking up with a jump. I am truly glad to hear it. He has brought you a pill, my dear Duchess. I think I should feel quite well if he only felt my pulse, said Duchess, backing away from the magpie who sidled up with something in his beak. It is only a bread pill. You had much better take it. Drink a little milk, my dear Duchess. I'm feeling very much better, my dear Ribby, said Duchess. Do not think I had better go home before it gets dark. Perhaps it might be wise, my dear Duchess. Ribby and Duchess said goodbye affectionately, and Duchess started home. Halfway up the lane, she stopped and looked back. Ribby had gone in and shut her door. Duchess slipped through the fence and ran round to the back of Ribby's house and peeped into the yard. Upon the roof of the pigsty sat Dr. Maggotty and three jackdaws. The jackdaws were eating pie crust, and the magpie was drinking gravy out of a patty pan. Duchess ran home feeling uncommonly silly. When Ribby came out for a pail full of water to wash up the tea things, she found a pink and white pie dish lying smashed in the middle of the yard. Ribby stared with amazement. Did you ever see the like? So there really was a patty pan. But my patty pans are all in the kitchen cupboard. Well, I never did. Next time I want to give a party, I will invite Cousin Tabitha to a jit. The end. Goosey Goosey Gander, whither will you wander? Upstairs and downstairs, 
and in my lady's chamber. Ninny Nanny Nettycoat in a white petticoat with a red nose. The longer she stands, the shorter she grows. Gravy and potatoes in a good brown pot. Put them in the oven and serve them very hot. There once was an amiable guinea pig who brushed back his hair like a periwig. He wore a sweet tie as blue as the sky and his whiskers and buttons were very big. 